Dr. Benjamin Safransky, lecturer in theology at Steubenville University. Thanks for being with us. Oh, you're welcome, Cy. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, and we'll uh, talk about uh, I, someone I take m- must be an important person to you because you wrote a book about him, St. Cyprian of Carthage. You wrote a book called St. Cyprian of Carthage and the College of Bishops. Yeah, he's a very uh, he's a very important figure and uh, someone that is very close to my heart. I, I'm I'm glad to hear it. Before we get into him and his relation to the kind of the the challenges of today, uh, he lived uh, in the what we would call the third century, the two hundreds. Can you give us some idea of who and the what's and the wheres of Saint Cyprian's life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Saint Cyprian lived in in the middle of the third century, and we don't know a lot about him from before his conversion to Christianity because he didn't like talking about it that much. He considered the the new man that he became in his baptism to be the important kind of phase of his life. But he was an, he was an educated uh, man, probably practiced uh, law um, or one of the other uh, rhetorical professions, became a Christian in the 240s, and eventually Bishop of Carthage in about 250 or 251. Now, Carthage is in northern Africa, in what is now Tunisia, and um, at that time was the second biggest and most prominent city in the Western Roman Empire behind the city of Rome. Carthage had been for, I mean, it's probably 400 years before that, but had been the great, uh, really the battle uh, for who would be the supreme city-state of the Mediterranean was between Rome and Carthage, and, and Rome prevailed. Right, right, yeah, through uh, some famous wars and, uh, you know, the vicissitudes of history, yeah, this, Rome, it, Rome conquers. Turns out even if you bring elephants over the Alps, it, you, can't, you can't beat the Romans. <laughs> well, you have to keep them alive, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that easy to do, right? Uh, so, but, but part of what's striking to me, uh, and, I, and I always like to, when, whenever we're talking about a Tertullian or a Cyprian or an Augustine uh, is to remember the Catholic Church of Africa that uh, suffered a very hard fate in the seventh and eighth centuries. Uh, but it was uh, the heart of Christianity. I mean, it's not, not not the heart of Christianity in the sense that it's superior to say Rome or 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 Asia or it. But it's not a foreign land. This is the heartland of Christianity. Christians there are thriving, well-educated, wealthy, and and important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think we tend to think of our worlds as being focused around land masses, like a continent or a country. But in this part of the world in those days, it really focused around the Mediterranean Sea, and Carthage and the other parts of Christian North Africa were part of that kind of oval of Christianity uh, bordering the Mediterranean. Right. And uh, uh, Cyprian himself was probably uh, what we might today call a Berber. Is that something like that? Um, it's, It's possible. Yes, it's hard to say exactly. Um, but the Christians in North Africa at that time were generally a mix of local North African uh, indigenous peoples, right. we would call Berbers, as well as Roman and European uh, transplants. Uh, he came from a wealthy family. Yes, for sure, for sure. And, and we know that because... Uh, during the controversies that he faced, he had large family properties uh, that he was able to kind of put at the disposal of the Christian church. So uh, here's another thing, though. This is uh, the Roman Empire is, is, is thriving still. This is, it's a massive, and uh, no one would have expected that in you know 200 years after the birth of, of Cyprian that the empire would be in the ruins that it, 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 it fell to. Uh, it's a big, strong, healthy empire, and here's these Christians doing just fine. So uh, Christianity is in a kind of—it's it, not 
It's it, well, in other words, I, I suppose what I'm getting at is it, it, the Christianity is in, in a relatively comfortable position until a certain persecution starts uh, during the time that Cyprian is bishop. Right, and that's the thing about persecutions that we sometimes get mixed up is that they they came and went depending on who the emperor was as well as who the other government officials were. And so in the time before Cyprian's episcopate, and you're referring to, I assume, the Decian, the persecution of the emperor Decius. Yeah. Um, Christianity was, as you said, in a fairly in a fairly stable place, in a fairly prosperous place, and the Church of Carthage was one of the major churches. And so he's the bishop of Carthage. When the Decian persecution starts, or was that the Valerian persecution? So the persecution. So Cyprian's uh, his episcopacy has a persecution on either end. Oh, okay. the one. In the beginning is the Decian persecution, and that's around the year 248, 249. And then he dies during the Valerian persecution. So I think during the Cyprian uh, persecution, he did a wise and noble thing. Uh, but it doesn't sound wise and noble. He ran away. <laughs> he hid. <laughs> He did, and from hiding, he wrote about how noble it was to run away every once in a while. <laughs> Well, the Lord right. himself, I mean, and, and I do think Cyprian had a point about this. It was like, Jesus himself uh, hid. Jesus himself, you know, they took him to the brim of a hill to, th to throw him over, and he walked away. He didn't just say, yeah, throw me over. Uh, so Cyprian felt that he was following the Lord's example in running away and hiding. Yeah, he did. And like, uh, like Jesus, I think Cyprian said that... He was running essentially because he thought that it was the best thing for the community, the best thing for the Christian community to still have their leader, even if he was temporarily away from them. He was afraid of what would happen to the Christian community of Carthage if he was if he was taken and killed then. Yeah. Uh, and of course, his some of his opponents took this as a sign of cowardice, but eventually— during the Valerian persecution, he would prove that when he felt the time was right, he was ready to submit to execution. Yeah, he said at the moment of his uh, condemnation, he said, glory be to God or something along those lines. He gave glory to God right. at the moment of the sentence. But um, the I, I say this in part because I do think this is related to our time. We, we do not face anything like a Decian uh, persecution, but one doesn't know what the future will bring. It, certainly in some parts of the world, the persecution of Christians is uh, quite similar uh, to that. In some ways, it's, uh, it's just as violent but less organized in other parts of the world. Uh, but the idea that... Uh, finding ways around persecution is acceptable is is an idea to keep in mind i think it is and that was a that was a really fine line that cyprian and the other christians had to walk um so for example during the dcn persecution if you didn't actually do what the romans wanted and offer sacrifice to the emperor it was also possible to get essentially a forged certificate saying yes. that you had sacrificed. Right. And while the bishops essentially decided that that was going a little too far, it, it, I think it is worth noting that Christians, you know, well-meaning Christians considered that it was possible that you could essentially deceive those in authority uh, if you thought that it, if it served a greater good. It might have been tempting, too, because you weren't necessarily deceiving those in authority. Like, these were people you lived in community with, and they probably kind of winked at you and went, you, you know, yeah, a throw me a couple of, uh, you know, I don't know, those coins with Caesar's head on them, and, and we'll, we'll make, we can make this go away. You don't have to go through this. Right, right. It was, um, you know— I think it was. It could be kind of. It could be a little bit complicated, though, within the Christian community, because 
Uh, the biggest question is if you get one of these forged certificates and you're able to avoid penalties, which, you know, would have had implications not just for your yourself, but for your whole family and your whole household, if you're responsible for the good of, of all these people. Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, am I going to cause scandal? Are other yeah. Christians going to think that I've actually submitted to the emperor and I've actually sacrificed? So it, it was a complicated question. It and but it, and it continues to be. You know, when you think about, um, okay, so uh, people today uh, being put in a situation, say healthcare professionals, uh, and they say, I won't uh, say it's a, a pharmacist, and the pharmacist says, I, I I'm I'm not I I can't fill prescriptions for an abortifacient, for example. Uh, but they might be told, well, y- yeah, but you can tell the person that that I can't fill this. Uh, and then you call the manager over, and the the manager fills it. Um, this is this requires some very careful moral parsing of at what point am I avoiding the implication of so called sacrificing to the emperor here, and at what point am I just weaseling out of it? And it's not always that easy to see. It's not, and you know we're fortunate in our day and age to have you know, uh, an additional almost 2,000 years of moral reasoning and wisdom yeah. on the part of the church where we we can talk about things in terms of cooperation with evil, right? That's our most common sort of category where we would use to talk about something like that. Um, I've taught a lot of nursing students, and the question of cooperation with evil is a very big one to them. Sure. Um you know, Cyprian and his, uh, you know, his, uh, the other Christians of his day didn't have the benefit of all those centuries of reasoning. And we're kind of trying, we're on the forefront of kind of trying to work this out of how to face this down. Right. Um, and so you had people who sacrificed to the Roman gods. They just straight up did it. They did what the Romans were demanding they do. You had people mm-hmm. who either by a bribe or by a connection, just got the libelli uh, or the the paper signed, and it's it's like you got a, a permission slip or something. Okay, you can go live your life. You got this thing. Uh, there's people who uh, did what Cyprian did and ran away, just hid, just said, uh, "No, I'm. The, the, I'll, I'll wait for this to pass. I'll come back when this is over." And then uh, you had people who were tortured and martyred, and never. Uh, acquiesced in any way. They gave a pure witness all the way to de- to death uh, for the Christian faith. So that's quite a variety of responses from the Christian community. It is, and that's that's one of the. To me, it's one of the sort of heartening and beautiful things to learn from a period of time like this. You know, we tend, I think, we look back on the days of the martyrs or the days of persecution, I think as probably more simple and glorious than they actually were when the reality is that, uh, people were really struggling about what to do about what the right choices were and about what they thought they could endure. And one of the, I would say one of the beautiful, th- beautiful things about the persecutions in Cyprian's day is that many of the Christians who did relent in some way, who either sacrificed or ended up getting these forged books, they came back to the church seeking forgiveness. And that, that was a big part of the controversy. But these were people who were struggling with what can I possibly endure and where does my strength really come from? Yeah, okay, so uh, as the Romans, uh, Latins would, they came up with a clever nickname for the people who had lapsed. They called them lapsy. And uh, <laughs> and uh, so how does Cyprian come down on all this? So he's a guy, already he's under criticism himself because he ran away. So his enemies are saying he's a chicken. And now he has to deal with the lapsy controversy. How does he deal with it? So in the beginning, he was uh, what you'd probably call a hardliner. He was very, very strict on the lapsed who came back to the church seeking forgiveness. In the very beginning, 
uh, he thought that those who had sacrificed, he wasn't sure that they could ever be readmitted to the church. And those who had obtained these forged certificates, he thought possibly could, but only after a lifetime of penance. Um, but again, I think one of the beautiful things about Cyprian is that two things happen. One, time passes, and as a pastor, he can see the difficulty that his people are under, and I think their genuine desire to come back for the strength in the church, especially the strength of the Eucharist. Yeah. And two, as more bishops uh, basically take a somewhat lighter stance against the lapsi, he, he essentially admits that the Holy Spirit is moving the bishops as a whole towards this lighter position, and so he brings himself around to that. Uh, that, that is a beautiful uh, uh, openness that he has to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's docile, in other words. Yes, yes. He's extremely clear about what he thinks the right things to do are. Yeah. But when he sees that the Spirit is moving the church in a certain direction, he brings himself into that. He brings himself into the movement of the Spirit. Well, there's some wisdom we need in the modern world, too. That, that um, uh, um, uh, It's interesting that he sees a kind of, as a consensus is forming of the bishops, among the bishops, that's how he sees the how you tell what the Holy Spirit is. That that's the sign that he takes to be. Well, this must be from the Holy Spirit. If if the other bishops are going are kind of tending in a certain direction. Yeah, absolutely. And it, um, you know, in retrospect, it can be it can be hard to discern how exactly the bishops at this time saw this consensus forming. And, you know, consensus is this word that they use, which means, right, a common thought or a common feeling. It wasn't, it wasn't a democratic movement. It wasn't about votes in a, you know, a kind of Episcopal conference, but it was about the overall movement of the world's bishops mm -hmm. in the same direction. I have to say to a modern person, a modern Catholic person, the idea that Cyprian even began with the position that said uh, those who sacrifice to the gods can't ever come back is actually, uh, I mean, we're always told there's God always forgives. There's never a time where you're beyond the forgiveness. Like this is uh, so basic that I think we almost start catechesis with this. This is probably among the four or five ideas that you start preschool catechesis with, that there's... God is unlimited in his uh, gratuitous forgiveness. And here's a, a great saint of the church uh, saying, no, nah, if you sacrifice to the Roman gods, that's it. You're done. Right. And, uh, you know, this is one of those reminders that the saints don't always have it right. Okay. <laughs> and, that, and that the saints in their time didn't have everything that we have in later centuries, you know, the wisdom of the church. Um, however, you know, the way they, I think the way they saw it, the way Cyprian saw it was that God's forgiveness is unlimited, but that that's between you and him oh. after you, after you die. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that that part of the way they thought of it was that they needed to protect the integrity of the sacraments, right? It's, uh, the the integrity see. of the Eucharist was a very, very important thing. Um, Isn't that interesting? That, that it's the same uh, debate we have now about the sacraments. Is, <laughs> is, 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 uh, and I'm not saying it's the same debate in, in the sense that the, the issues are the same, but the, the, the urgency of the matter is, how are we going to make sure that this that the sacredness of the sacraments is preserved among a people that's so sinful that, and and so and gets we get ourselves into all kinds of trouble we get ourselves into all kinds of situations that are are clearly grossly prob problematic and and we want to maintain the, the sacredness of the sacraments it, it's it, the problem hasn't gone away Protecting the integrity of the sacraments was was very important, and, and one thing maybe that that could remind us, or could be a reminder to us, is that uh, for for Christians in Cyprian's day, one of the prerequisites for readmission to the Eucharist, regardless of what you had done, was repentance, was repentance and readmission by the bishop. The the 
people did not consider themselves to have a right to the Eucharist in the way we think of rights. Oh, okay, I see. That is instructive uh, for today. Well, I mean, I suppose in a certain way that that whole idea of rights, uh, you know, how could you ever deny the Eucharist to anyone? I, it's like I have a, this is, it belongs to me. It's a, God gave it to me, it belongs to me. But you're saying, no, the lesson we might take from, uh, for, even from Cyprian's time, when, when the church is still forming its theology about these things, is, uh, no, this is a matter for the church to decide who, who is to receive communion. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I mean, I think one of the things that's instructive for me about studying history is that we tend to go back and forth between kind of extreme positions, and often the, the wisdom is in the middle, right? And yeah. it's, it's very possible to be so concerned with protecting the Eucharist that we go too far in that direction, and we're trying to judge people uh, judge their status with God. It's also possible to go too far in the other direction and say everybody can receive the Eucharist who wants it. Um, but what is very clear in the early church, including Cyprian's day, is that is the idea that the bishop has a sacred duty as the kind of the gatekeeper of the church, not the person who's standing there judging everyone's heart before God but the person who has a, a sacred duty to ensure that those who are admitted are ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's striking in reading a, a little bit about Cyprian's life that, um, uh, you know, he started out this hardliner and he mellowed a bit, but he didn't mellow all the way to the complete, uh, don't, don't, nobody should worry about anything. But there were actual North African bishops, bishops that were in his area, who were pretty lenient, who were pretty much like, nah, this is, just don't worry about it, just come back to communion. Yeah, there were, and in his own, uh, in his own church, he faced a little bit of a schism uh, over that issue, which was led actually by a layman, believe it or not, uh, a layman and a small group of priests. Um, so it's not like the entire spirit of the day in the third century was all about super strictness and utter and complete discipline. Um, there were those who, for one reason or another, as you mentioned, um, preached a, a fairly loose readmission to the sacraments. And Cyprian's biggest problem with that actually wasn't uh, that God can't have mercy on these people. His biggest issue was that people who preached this kind of forgiveness um, were taking it out of the hands of the local bishop. Oh. So if you're if you're a bishop in another part of Africa uh, from Cyprian and you say, okay, everyone should be readmitted to the sacraments if they just come back and they want it, uh, Cyprian might say, okay, if that's the discipline you want to put in place in your church, then you will be answerable to God for that. But don't tell me what I can do in Carthage because I'm the bishop here. Right, right. And 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 uh, even though this is a big city, people would have known one. Like they, they, these are not scandals that are anonymous. People know who did what after the persecution. So um, he wants to maintain a certain a level of clarity, moral clarity through all of this, I suppose. Uh, the guy, the layman who led this uh, opposition, did did he have a podcast? <laughs> not that I've ever, not that I've ever heard of. And his name, his name was Felicissimus, which means most happy. Uh, this this yeah. guy was most happy about everything. Yeah, I, I think he had a podcast. I think I remember. Yeah, he was a. That's how you do it. If you want to fix the church, get a podcast. <laughs> that's how you do it. Um, so. Uh, uh, then the, the persecution ends, and he's uh, Cyprian is still bishop. Uh, you, you, the title of your book is Saint Cyprian of Carth Carthage and the College of Bishops. Why? Why did you want to stress uh, the College of Bishops? Well, I wanted to stress the College of Bishops because Cyprian's in Cyprian's writing is the first time we get this really developed look at how the bishops work together. You know, one of the things we 
sometimes I think doesn't get enough thought is the fact that the way the church works as a body is kind of dependent on the the day and age. So things like communication and travel are extremely important to how the church works together. And this is a time when, because of persecution, Christians can't travel openly all the time. Bishops can't always travel to get together, but they are called to face this sort of this threat to the whole body. And Cyprian realizes that. So a lot of the time he, uh, when he's, when he's making these pronouncements, he'll say something like, or he'll write something like, this is what I think is best for Carthage right now. But in order to figure this out on a larger scale, we're going to have to wait until we as bishops can get together and come to come to a more settled conclusion. And so it's clear to him that already in the middle of the third century that the mind of the bishops as a whole throughout the world is a really important way that the Holy Spirit guides the church. Uh, so he was uh, he would have. Um... Uh, approved of or uh, the a uh, kind of um uh, conciliar and synodal church the way that the modern church is kind of uh, attempting yeah absolutely i mean obviously you know expressed in different ways and right. you know allowing for many centuries of development but it uh, the way that they saw questions in the church is coming to a settled decision was essentially through the consultation of bishops with each other and actually taking into account the the positions of priests and even lay people so Cyprian on, on various occasions he'll he'll make it clear that these decisions need to be made by groups of bishops but that the priests have a place at these consultations and yeah. that even the voice of the laity needs to be heard. Yeah. It's, it's not a purely democratic process and the laity don't have the same say in it that the bishops do, but he wants the, he wants oh. the, the voice of the people to be known essentially. And that, um, that's just sort of the way the Holy spirit leads the church to a settled position on these questions. It, it does seem to me that the that the modern church, but, but whether it's uh, John the Twenty Third or P Paul the Sixth, Pope John Paul the Great, even to Francis now, has been looking for a way to do just that to to say, all right, if if Christ has given us this this role of the bishop, and if the bishops can develop consensus. Uh, and and develop and, and if you could somehow read the the movements among the bishops, you would be able to govern the church in a way that was truly responsive. It just seems to me that they've pretty much all failed at that. That they're, the the church is so big that no one has found a a a, a, a kind of um, a, a way of organizing that listening to the bishops that is convincing to anyone or is, is it seems to be functional. It, it, it all seems formalistic and like, yeah, they tried this, they tried that, but I don't know that, I, and I wonder if, you, you know, you know how Cyprian thought about it. What, what do you think of my assessment? Yeah. Well, one, and one of the, one of the, obviously I think one of the major differences between Cyprian's day and our day is that in our day, the, essentially the, democratic spirit of the world has kind of taken over. Oh, so yeah. when you start, and I think this is one of the problems with getting people to understand what synodality is, that when you start talking about decision-making, listening, et cetera, people expect it to look like a democratic political process. Yeah, right. Let's you, have a vote. You know, Cip exactly. In Cyprian's day, they were starting from a position where the power rested so much at the top that they didn't necessarily have that same kind of prejudice. Yeah, I see. And so the, the, in a way, the communal, I, I would call it the communal decision-making of the bishops, the collegial decision-making of the bishops and the priests was, it almost had a sort of a, a fresher ground 
to to tread on if that makes some sense I, i do see yeah it doesn't come with all the baggage of our our language of modern rights and it doesn't come with all the habits of of democracy and and that uh that can i'm sure in some ways be helpful but also can be obscuring but also uh, a church of a billion people is harder to govern than a church of uh, I don't know four or five million people. Maybe it is, but our our communication and travel are so much better now. Oh, that's true. You know, I, I, you make a good point. Yeah, right. There are yeah. positives and negatives. Yeah, that's right. One other one, one other thing about that I, I think is worth mentioning is that um, Cyprian, with all his focus, and it's not just his focus on collegiality among the bishops, but we just see it through his lens because he's the one who was writing about it so much. Um, the way they saw this movement of the spirit working was essentially in questions that hadn't been answered yet. So, uh, so for, for Cyprian and his fellow bishops, these things were open to the movement of the Holy Spirit through the collegial action of the bishops as long as they were not – settled questions in Christianity. But once we had kind of discerned the answer to a question, like let's just say, you know, Jesus Christ is God and man, then after that, it doesn't matter if all the bishops in the world go against that. It, you, you can't too, vote yeah, yeah, I see. I out see. of tradition. Right. Um, which is, you know, one of the differences between the way I think he saw collegiality and the way some people now do because um, the, you know this part of this democratic world spirit that we live in now says uh, we think the church is wrong about something so let's all get together and talk about it and maybe we can go back and undo it yeah. well yeah. that idea would have been completely anathema to Cyprian well we're we, I mean, part of being modern is uh, to believe that the way you get to to purity is through a, a revolution. I mean, we really believe in revolutions. We believe in progress. Whereas for Cyprian, I imagine the way you get to purity is to say, uh, what you go into the past, you see what Christ taught, and you try to uh, bring that into the future to address whatever the current. Uh, issue is that it's not primarily revolutionary. It's it's very very conservative in a sense. Yeah, it is, and uh, I I think you know one one of the ways that you see that happen is that Cyprian describes when he describes let's say the, a meeting of bishops that addresses a question, he always says that they started out from scripture. That is always where the bishops start. And in a sense, you could see that as a as making sure that they are rooted in the authoritative documents yes. which are coming out of the past, right, into the present. Right. That, this is very helpful, I think, because there is something very helpful about seeing how it was done uh, before the world developed certain unhelpful habits of mind. As much as there, as you said, there, there are also gifts. We shouldn't deny the gifts of being modern, but there are unhelpful modern habits of mind that we would be really well instructed to, to minimize. Yeah, I think that's true. And it, um, I, you know, again, one of the things about studying history for me is, is sort of it, it can just, it's just a reminder that people in every age start off from the position of kind of the mindset of their age. And so we, as Christians, we, in every century, we have to discern what, what part of our thinking truly is in line with the Christian heritage and the Christian tradition. And what part of it is sort of a, am I being locked in by present day ways of thinking that I could leave behind or that I could get outside of? Um, all right, so I, I think we've come near to our end, so we better uh, get to Cyprian's uh, end, his uh, noble end under uh, the Emperor Valerian. Uh, tell us what, what happened with Cyprian. So Cyprian, um, right, so I, as I mentioned before, his, his episcopate was kind of, it was bookended by these two persecutions. And uh, with a period of peace in between, a kind of tenuous peace. Uh, so another per- persecution ari- arises in the mid-250s. Um, 
under the Emperor Valerian, and Cyprian again goes into hiding or is outside of the city of Carthage. Um, but at this point, he comes to the sort of the prayerful discernment that unlike in the Decian persecution, when he had just started as bishop and he felt like his community needed this really strong leader still in place, when it comes to the Valerian persecution, he decides that the best thing for the community now is to see the end of his life as a witness, um, as a witness to right, the refusal to give in to uh, the, the demands of the world that we sacrifice to the, you know, to the emperor. And so he peacefully returns to Carthage um, of his own volition. He's not taken prisoner. He's not captured and brought back into Carthage. He comes in of his own accord because he decides that his martyrdom would be the best witness he could give. And um, he's, he's given the death that he, that he knows he's going to uh, in front of the, the Roman officials and, um, and it it sows the seeds of further development, you know, not just further development, but further, you know, growth and love of Christianity in in North Africa. You know, Augustine looks on Cyprian as the great master, the great master of North African Christianity, and as one whose death gave credibility to everything he had said and done before. And, and that's what's, in a way, that's what's so great about his martyrdom, because a lot of the things he had done before perhaps wouldn't have had the same force they did if he had not backed up his words with his life. And and Christianity in North Africa did indeed uh, thrive, as you can see with uh, Augustine, who, who had a much more minor... Uh, Bishopric than uh, Cyprian did, uh, mm -hmm. but was a, but was certainly a, the more important uh, figure in the long run. Uh, sure, but, but um, and that Christianity thrived uh, until uh, Islam made its way across across North Africa, and then uh, was uh, bit by bit snuffed out. But it is a time; it, it's a glorious time and worth remembering that. Uh, from Jerusalem, the church went out in every direction to all people, uh, regardless of where they lived, what the condition of their life was, what certainly what the color of their skin was. That would not have been a consideration to early Christians. And uh, it's a beautiful, com beautiful community. It's a tragedy that it's not there anymore, but uh, we can give thanks to God for men like St. Cyprian. Yeah, and we have, I mean, even though the, the church in North Africa as Cyprian experienced it and Augustine experienced it is not there anymore. I mean, the theological heritage and the spiritual heritage that we have still from those days, it, you know, gives, can give life to the church now. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time with us, uh, Dr. Sapransky. Uh, God bless you and your work. God bless you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the chance to talk about Cyprian anytime. All right. Very good. Thank you.